Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. How are you doing, Michael? I'm all right, thank you, Fee. Spring is springing and things are changing again. Uh, there's, an, there's an easing of restrictions. I've got a campsite booked for mm. Monday, which might have been a terrible idea. I might be stuck in traffic all day Monday, we'll see. Um, but I'm very excited to, to get out of London and, um, yeah, get in the van, get the music going, wind the window down. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I'm, I'm very good. As you say, the spring springing is a great thing and the longer... Yeah. The longer days are helpful, aren't they? Yeah, there's that sense that we're beginning to emerge into something else, which, you know, has its own set of difficulties with it, perhaps, and, and, and maybe some anxieties. But it's good to feel that something's shifting, isn't it? You know, there's movement. Yeah. Uh, I'm really thinking about all the people who run all the venues for live mm. performance and... You know, they must be having such a... Of course, there's the excitement of being able to open doors, but there's also this just immense difficulty of conditions under which it can happen and forward and back steps with things and projects that are all sort of backed up in the system, as it were. I mean, it's really tough, I think. So really thinking about those people at the moment, actually just working so hard to bring live performance back for us. Yeah, yeah. Fee, just before we go any further, I just want to remind people that we are having two exchange days, uh, days where we talk to people about a poem that's been a friend to them on the 22nd and the 23rd of April. That's the Thursday and Friday. Um, I believe there are still a couple of spots left. Um, no more than that. But if you have got a poem that's been a friend to you, we'd love to hear about it. Please do get in touch uh, either via the website, thepoetryexchange.co.uk, or you can email us at info at thepoetryexchange.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. Well, it kind of feels appropriate, actually, you know, saying about kind of, you know, regaining freedom of the road and the possibility of actually re-entering the landscape that we've got this month, this episode, with a, with a poem that is so profoundly about being in landscape. Um, it feels kind of, kind of good to be celebrating that, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, that's right, Fee. Yeah, it's a, it's a Ted Hughes poem we've got this month and it's um I wasn't familiar with any Ted Hughes poems I'm, I wasn't quite sure what to expect but it's uh I mean as you'll hear on the thing I'm quite sort of blown away by it actually it really had an effect on me it's a really powerful poem isn't it and and in a way that I don't really fully understand and we sort of find ourselves kind of talking around this poem quite a lot I think in a way almost trying to go you know there's something in this isn't there <laughs> what is it it's it's kind of got this sort of magical mythical sort of yeah power there's a real power to it isn't there yeah I think in that respect it's possible that it might be one of those episodes where if you want to have the text of the poem kind of to hand that might be a good thing I was going to say that I think that's a really good idea actually if you can yeah mm. So it'll be on the description page as usual. So you'll be hearing myself and Michael talking about The Horses by Ted Hughes, the poem that's been a friend to Louis. I don't even know where to start because this poem is kind of extraordinary. If it's all right, Louis, if we could hear you read it. Okay. I climbed through woods in the hour before dawn dark, evil air, a frost-making stillness, not a leaf, not a bird, a world cast in frost. I came out above the wood where my breath left tortuous statues in the iron light, but the valleys were draining the darkness till the moorline, blackening dregs of the brightening grey, halved the sky ahead, and I saw the horses, huge in the dense grey, Ten together, megaliths still. They breathed, making no move, 
with draped manes and tilted hind hooves, making no sound. I passed. Not one snorted or jerked its head. Grey silent fragments of a grey silent world. I listened in emptiness on the moor ridge. The curlew's tear turned its edge on the silence. Slowly, detail leafed from the darkness. Then the sun, orange, red, red erupted. Silently and splitting to its core, tore and flung cloud, shook the gulf open, showed blue, and the big planets hanging. I turned, stumbling in the fever of a dream, down towards the dark woods from the kindling tops, and came to the horses. There still they stood, but now steaming and glistening under the flow of light, their draped stone manes, their tilted hind hooves stirring under a thaw, while all around them the frost showed its fires. But still they made no sound, not one snorted or stamped, their hung heads, patient as the horizons, high over valleys, in the red levelling rays, in din of the crowded streets, going among the years, the faces, may I still meet my memory in so lonely a place, between the streams and the red clouds, hearing curlews, hearing the horizons endure. Beautifully read. Brilliant. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. This is sort of extraordinary. I don't know this at all, Louis. Um, right. And um, I'm really reeling from it a bit. There's a bit that almost reminds me of Dylan Thomas because he really makes use of sound. Yeah. And the, you know, the, 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 the sound of the language is clearly really important to him. Yeah. And, of course, there's this focus on nature um, that reminds me of Dylan Thomas. Um, but, but I get slightly lost towards the end of this. It's one of those that's really evocative. You can really picture yourself, I find, really picture myself there on this walk in the early morning, the hour before dawn dark. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Everything's still. And, and he comes across these horses. And then towards the end, I shouldn't be rushing to the end, but I just sort of, it, it left me going, oh, I'm not quite sure what happened there. In din of the crowded streets, Going among the years, the faces, may I still meet my memory in so lonely a place. What's happening there? I, uh, I mean, everyone will have their own idea, really, won't they? But um, it's kind of interesting because he, he kind of, you've got this character that goes on this journey through the woods, comes across the horses, then the sun surfaces in all its glory, bathes the horses in light, and then he, he returns to like an urban setting, doesn't he, towards the end? Yeah. And I, I kind of like that. It's it's like, you know what, after this beautiful, well, I'll call it casually a landscape, this beautiful landscape and the horses, you've got just basically crowds and towns and cities. And he puts his right, right back into the urban Mm. And then kind of just comes out with a line, may I still meet my memory in so lonely a place. Um, I mean, reading it again now, it could be that, you know, amongst amongst all those people in, in, a, in a city, that actually it's quite a lonely place. And he'd rather be back between the streams and the red clouds. Or it, it could be simply out on the moors there. It's quite a lonely place, but actually it's beautiful, the streams and the red clouds. Mm. It's a really strong ending, actually. I've never really noticed it too much, hearing curlews, hearing the horizons endure. It's really kind of strong and hopeful at the end, I think. That's fascinating, isn't it? Hearing the horizons endure. There's a few places where he does that, where it's sort of a clever kind of double either an unusual claiming of a verb with a noun or there's a kind of double thing going on. Yeah. The curlew's tear or tear turned its edge on the silence. Yeah. I, I didn't know uh, how to pronounce that, <laughs> to be honest. I always go it's for so tear. so great. Yeah. But I think it's consciously also the call of the curlew. Yeah. That's the way I, I've kind of had to imagine it. Because it, it breaks the silence, really. Mm. I mean, Michael said at the start that, that it seemed to be about sound. 
And you've got that throughout the poem, really, the contrast between, well, actually, there's very little sound, even when the sun erupts, you know, the sun erupts silently. You've got that contrast between the eruption of the sun and silence. You've got these breathing horses, but they don't make any sound. Mm. And you've got this this really magical frost-making stillness at the start. You know, it's it's very still. You know, that, that kind of struck me each time I, I read it. I mean, the killer lines for me, grey silent fragments of a grey silent world. Mm. It's just almost like it's otherworldly. Yeah, I love megalith still as well. Yeah. It's brilliant, isn't it? He really gets that stillness that you get in horses because yeah. they, horses have such a presence, don't they? They really, like like no other creature, they have this presence. I think in, in lots of mythologies, they are portals, aren't they, to, to the other world? Yeah. And he certainly brings them to life. Mm. So how, how long have you known this poem, Louis? I guess about five or six years. Okay. But there's definitely it definitely transports me to a different place. You know, it's, it's hard to put language to your experience, isn't it, reading a book or good poetry, but there's definitely something happens through reading this that puts me in that place. And like you say, there's something otherworldly about these horses that I, you, I can't quite put my finger on, but it's kind of magical. And I did like that phrase as well, megalith still. Mm. Yeah, there's just something absolutely primal in that phrase. Ted uses, I mean, he's a kind of bit of a master at it, isn't he, really? Combining the magical with the brutal. You know, you, in the, at the start of the poem, you've got like evil air, iron light. It's hard. It's a hard, brutal hour before dawn. Mm. In a way, it's not that magical, really but it's a world cast in frost. You've constantly got that rub between this kind of brutal, stark landscape and mm. and something wonderful about it. Something kind of majestic yeah. about the horses, isn't there? Yeah. But that's great, Louis. I love that. You know, the thing you're identifying there about nature as kind of brutal and harsh and unresponsive to yeah. us in a way you know that it's not it's not kind of going you know welcome to your lovely sun morning walk you know yeah, it's yeah, sort of yeah. just there doing what it's doing and there's something brilliant about the combination of that kind of unforgiving presence of nature in some way that is the magic of it because it's more real and more true I mean, he, you know, he was into shamanism, wasn't he, Ted Hughes? So subconsciously, he might have been pitching this character into the evil air with its iron light, you know, a character up against it like you would in on a kind of mythical journey. You know, like I said, Hughes was into sh shamanism and, you know, trans journeys. And, the, you know, the character in those journeys are changed by it, aren't they? And here you've got this character who's witnessed the horses and then stumbling through the woods, you know, they're lost. Yeah. They're like the mythical hero, they're, they're, they're kind of lost in a way. They don't know what to do. They're stumbling. And then suddenly they see the horses again. And the horses are, are just beautifully illuminated under the light. And yet absolutely still. It, it, yeah, it can't fail to be kind of numinous in, in a way. This, I mean, in a, in a way earlier on in the poem, even if you didn't think it was particularly spiritual, even if you don't like that word, you've got, I noticed reading the poem this morning, the word grey pops up a few times um, mm. in the in the first half anyway. And it's like grey is like this liminal liminal space, isn't it? Colour. It's not black or white. It's mm. just in between. I don't know, it's that, again hard to put words to, but there's something mysterious going on there. But it beautifully, in a circular way, it comes back towards the end of the poem, back to the horses. I love that. He just sees it. So it was a bit of a surprise, probably, the first time I read the poem. It suddenly comes back to the horses <laughs> with their stone yeah. manes, mm. back to that kind of megalith kind of mm -hmm. quality. And it's just, 
yeah, the light, the stone, the elements, the wood. He, he, he knew what he was doing, just fantastic. The language is fantastic, isn't it? I love this bit, slowly, detail, lift from the darkness. Yeah. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. And then, and then colour comes into this world. Then the sun, orange, red, red erupted. Yeah. This bit I love. Silently and splitting to its core, tore and flung cloud, shook the gulf open, showed blue. I think that, I think that was the bit that made me think of Dylan Thomas, actually. Mm, mm. I love that. The poem changes, doesn't it, around there? Yeah. And, and you know, reading it this morning, I didn't want to get too caught up in the grammar and the line breaks, etc. But, um, you know, it's kind of funny that the line ends and a full stop it erupted. And it would have been tempting for him to carry on there. Orange, red, red erupted and splitting to its core. So, you know, some poets would have just carried on with that momentum of, of the, the sun erupting. But he just, he pauses and puts silently on the next kind of, mm. yeah, into that kind of couplet, if you like. So again, you've got that contrast between the sun erupted and then break, pause, silently and splitting to its core. There's something going on there that I can't quite explain, but yeah. Fiona, have you, have you come across this poem before? I have, yeah, I have. I mean, I think my reading of this is probably maybe 20 years ago or something, yeah. when I maybe hadn't had quite as many encounters with horses as I've had in the last 20 years. So now I read it very differently. Mm. It's amazing because it's quite early Ted Hughes, I think, as well, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's a good point. It is really probably in his first collection, I have <sighs> an educated guess. And, um, you know, the, the quality of it and the... Uh, the, sen the sensibility needed mm. to describe this experience. Mm. And I can imagine him doing that in person, Ted Hughes. I can imagine him going out, going out onto the moors uh, very, very early morning and just, well, just experiencing um, nature, to put it simply. I mean, I think that's, that's where the Dylan Thomas connection is happening for you, Michael, in the sense that I yeah. think both poets, you know, just profoundly engaged with the business of physical experience as lived through the body and then kind of resonating through that physical experience into the sound of language. Uh, you know, on occasions, he kind of, he, he does me head in as well. You know, I pick up a book and read one of his poems. I thought, oh, blimey, that's a bit, it's a bit too brutal, that. Mm. Or it's a bit too obtuse. I want something a little lighter. But you know what? I wouldn't swap him through the world. When I need a poem, I go back to this poem, or it might be Wind or October Salmon or one of those poems, and there's something different about these poems that connects you to nature and, and life. Is it then for you that this is that poem that says, come on, put your walking boots on, we're going out, we're going to get into the countryside, we're going to go and walk for a day? Yeah, certainly not in the hour before dawn dark, I have to say. <laughs> you know, um, but no, it's a, it's a good point. I think you've hit upon something there. I think because I do like walking out in the countryside, it's those moments where you do feel connected with, with life and yourself. L let's put it this way. There's a kindred spirit there in the speaker of the poem who's out in the countryside and they're changed by that experience. Yeah, and I love walking. Yeah, fresh air, trees, water, the elements, the senses. It's a poem of the senses, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. The, yeah. the sounds, the red clouds, hearing curlews, even the silence. It's the something, um, even though in one way it's like some big kind of shamanic journey of the, the speaker seeing these horses and then travelling through the woods, the sun comes up, there's big eruptions, and the horses are glistening in the light. There's just this this undertow of stillness all the time, and, and the horses being very still. With the last two couplets, that journey that it, he gives you at the end, it reminded me of the end of the Lake Isle of Innisfree, where he talks about standing on the pavements, grey. Oh yeah. And and still hearing 
the linnet's wing and the place of the lake isle in the deep hearts core, in the deep hearts core yeah right. so for me i mean i don't not saying that's necessarily a conscious thing for hughes or anything but it's such a clever thing he does about the present moment and the future and the past all in four lines right in din of the crowded streets going among the years yeah the faces may i still meet my memory in so lonely a place between the streams and the red clouds hearing curlews hearing the horizons endure it's a kind of pledge to his future self yeah that whatever that future self gets into in whatever crowded places that he will always feel this peace and this sense of endurance yeah it's very clever it is wording going among the years where you've got the noise of the streets we've mentioned the sounds it is slightly odd in a way isn't it the phrasing going among the years and may i still meet my memory in so lonely a place and it's brilliant because the positioning of lonelier place gives you the double meaning that you were talking about louis of this means both that both the street might be a lonely place but also that there's a positive lonely or yeah. positive is a bit of a glib word but you know there's this other lonely that he's seeking yeah which is just so brilliant that's it's nicely put that this other place that he's seeking even though it might be lonely Mm. And it can, it can be like that when you're out walking. I don't know if you, you go walking yourselves much, but it can be a bit lonely, a bit, you know, but not a kind of an overwhelming loneliness. It's just, yeah, it's just a loneliness you can endure in a way. Ted Hughes, The Horses. I climbed through woods in the hour before dawn dark. Evil air, a frost making stillness. Not a leaf, not a bird. A world cast in frost. I came out above the wood where my breath left tortuous statues in the iron light. But the valleys were draining the darkness till the moorline Blackening dregs of the brightening grey halved the sky ahead, and I saw the horses, huge in the dense grey, ten together, megalith still. They breathed, making no move, with draped manes and tilted hind hooves, making no sound. I passed. Not one snorted or jerked its head. Grey, silent fragments of a grey, silent world. I listened in emptiness on the moor ridge. The curlew's tear turned its edge on the silence. Slowly, detail leafed from the darkness. Then the sun, orange, red, Red erupted silently and splitting to its core, tore and flung cloud, shook the gulf open, showed blue and the big planets hanging. I turned, stumbling in the fever of a dream, down towards the dark woods from the kindling tops and came to the horses. There, still they stood, but now steaming and glistening under the flow of light. Their draped stone manes, their tilted hind hooves, stirring under a thaw, while all around them the frost showed its fires. But still they made no sound. Not one snorted or stamped, their hung heads patient as the horizons. High over valleys in the red levelling rays, 
in din of the crowded streets, going among the years, the faces. May I still meet my memory in so lonely a place, between the streams and the red clouds, hearing curlews, hearing the horizons endure. That was Fiona with the reading at the end there. Our thanks, of course, to Louis for giving us his time and for allowing us to use the conversation and to Faber and Faber for giving us permission to use this fabulous poem. And of course, also our thanks to the Manchester Literary Festival for hosting us back in October. Fee, it's actually our first Ted Hughes poem that we've had brought to us that's been nominated. I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by it, actually. I remain kind of in this place of, of feeling that it slightly eludes me in some way, but I am I feel like I want to get to know it more, like I, w- I want to spend a bit more time with it. Maybe, maybe I'll take a copy with me away in my van and I'll go on a long walk and uh, I'll have a read of it in Dorset. Mm, that sounds good. I think it is a bit of a case of letting it do its work, letting it do its work on you by kind of close reading where you're... You're kind of enjoying the way that the sounds and the images are just passing through you or into you, if you like, and not trying to work it out too much in your head. Yeah, yeah. You saying that, Michael, reminds me of that wonderful conversation that we had with Charlie, I think it was, who talked about actually taking books out into the forest with him and uttering words out to the the landscape and that in turn also reminds me of a fantastic conversation that I think we've both listened to I know we were you were talking about the fact that you were going to on on being with the poet Ocean Vyong which is a kind of incredible thing it's Krista Tippett talking to him before the pandemic and they're in a space together having the conversation and Ocean's talking about words and carefully chosen words and how words are received in person and the kind of person to personness of language. So all these things about physicality and language which feel very, very powerful at the moment as we think about coming back into being in a shared space and in one another's presence. Yeah. Of course, you've also done quite a clever thing there, Fiona, of (laughs) referencing our next guest. Next month, we've got a very special episode. We're absolutely thrilled that Krista Tippett uh, was very generous with her time a few weeks ago and has shared the most extraordinary conversation with us. She's somebody you and I have listened to over the years when we first were getting into podcasting. And uh, she's an extraordinary woman. And uh, she absolutely didn't disappoint when we virtually met her over, over the Ethernet. So, if you don't already subscribe, I can think of no better time to press the subscribe button um, and make sure that you don't miss next month's episode with the fabulous Krista Tippett. That's about all we've got time for this month. We'll be back with you next month. Until then, thank you for listening. Mm